Today is October 28th, 1980. Day to dedicate this church to you, Lord.
do hope community church. If you can help us this time by moving into the center, isn't it nice to not be on the aluminum chair? Slide <laughs> in and uh, make room. We've got people still coming in. We're going to need to have every available seat, it looks like. It's exciting, you know. Today is a day we've long been waiting for. An opportunity to dedicate to his glory, his building. I know I've had the privilege of being out a number of times and a lot of hard work has got into it. You know, more important than dedicating this building is an opportunity this Sunday and every Sunday to dedicate our lives. We thank you for joining us. For our visitors that have come this morning, we want to give you a special welcome. New Hope, as my wife and my family have found, is a very special place. It's not a facility, it's not uh, buildings, but it's people. And there are some very special people, as you'll find, in this body of believers. And we welcome you and trust that you'll find your time with us exciting and that God will meet your needs. One way for our visitors to help us out is if you would take a moment and locate it in the pew in front of you, this little small card. If you could take the time, please, to fill that out for us and we'll provide some information and a mechanism that we can follow up and, and uh, get back to you to make sure if you have any questions, we can take care of answering those questions. In addition, for our uh, regular attenders, the card is provided, and on uh, the back, there's a section where you can uh, fill in for a little prayer request, or if you want to make a special note to Pastor Rick or the staff, you can do that on the card provided. We're excited not only for this morning's worship time, but we're going to have a special time following this morning's worship service. If you would join us over in our education building, we have a lovely complimentary buffet at lunch. And uh, this is uh, obviously no charge to you. And it provides an opportunity for you to get to know the family here at New Hope. And I would encourage each and every one of you to join us following this morning's service over in the education building. All you simply need to do is go over, perhaps if you have young children, you want to pick those, you certainly want to pick them up. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you over there for a great lunch. If you've noticed in the bulletin, on the uh, inside of the bulletin, on the right hand side, there is a note about tonight's service. Now, tonight's service starts at 6 o'clock, and uh, I'm excited. It's neat. We've got a big lineup of people that have waited patiently for the opportunity to be baptized. And uh, along with the excitement of baptism, I think, is the uh, opportunity to hear a testimony of how they have come to know Christ. And uh, we'll have an opportunity to, to enjoy some singing. It's just an exciting time, and you don't want to miss that time. You know what's exciting is we uh, have an opportunity to worship together in a new facility, and uh, I think it's time. Would you now turn with me in your hymnals to number 256 as Mike comes to lead us in worship.
to number 392 in our hymnals. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus that is matchless against anything that he has created. It is deeper than the rolling seas, higher than the mountains. It's sparkling like a fountain. It's sufficient to save even the worst of us sinners and the best of us sinners. Let's sing together. throughout our community and also throughout the world. Lord, thank you for 
helping us to understand in a very personal way the all-sufficiency of your grace as you have reached down from heaven and engaged us in a wonderful relationship with our God and our Creator. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus that he came and that he lived and modeled for us how we might live and please you. And we're so grateful that in the fullness of time, he went to that cross to offer himself as a sacrifice to redeem all mankind from their sin. Today, Father, we give praise and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and to you, our Heavenly Father, for your abundant love and grace that you have displayed it to us, both in times past and today. This we ask and pray in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. <coughs>
service this morning in song. You take your bullets and you'll find a chorus sheet inside. And uh, we're going to sing. Our angels, turn to number 10. How the Lord Let's stand together as we sing, How Great the Lord Art. We consider all the world's tents that made through stars. Maybe the rolling thunder. We surely have the praise the praise of this morning.
Paul, it is a wonderful day. Mary, how would you like to join me in the scripture reading? It's in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 5. It's very fitting, this passage selected by the pastor, and it certainly is fitting for this morning. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And I think this, this congregation, this building, is all, is all fitting. It's, you can see how appropriate this passage is. And this morning we want to praise God with our gifts and our offerings. And at this time I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward. Shall we pray? Father, we just praise you for this wonderful day. We're thankful for this culmination, this bringing together of all the work and the prayers and the frustrations and the toil and the sweat. And we're thankful that this day has come. And we praise you for it. And we're just thankful that we can dedicate it today to your service, to your glory, that those who come here might know that Jesus Christ has come and has died and has risen again, that we might have life, that we might have it more abundantly. And Father, we just pray that you continue to lead this congregation and draw us ever closer to yourself. That the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we think might bring glory and praise to your precious name. And this morning as we bring in our offerings, we just pray that you'll accept them and that they will be used for your glory. That your name might forever be honored and glorified. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Bible, please, and turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 13. We're going to begin today by looking at just one small verse, a verse which expresses an understanding that we have here at New Hope Community Church about people in general who need to exist in their lives. Thirteenth chapter of the book of Proverbs, we begin reading in verse 12. It says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Would you join me please for a word of prayer? Father, at one time or another in each of our lives, we felt the sensation of at least disappointment, if not hopelessness. Today, as we read these words, we're reminded that this principle that's in your word is so true. And at times it seems as though there is no solution, no answer, no help to be found in these disappointing and hopeless situations that we face in life. Today, Father, I would pray that you would begin right now opening our hearts and our minds to your word. We might consider it as an important document as we read it today we might be sensitive to the spiritual truth and its practical application to our lives today. We might understand that indeed you did make us. In fact, as our creator, you do have some ideas to how we might live our life. And that that life might be a rewarding and full life rather than one full of disappointment. So today we ask that you would be our teacher, that the opinions and thoughts of men would be laid aside and that your spirit would teach us these important truths from God's word. This we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All of us have been disappointed at some time or another, perhaps at work, maybe with our marriage or our children. For some of you, life in general has not been what you had hoped it would be. It seems to be one giant disappointment. Well, here at the Old Community Church, we understand the concept of hope deferred. Because uh, we, like you, are normal, everyday people, believe it or not. And uh, we face the same problems that you might face uh, in your daily life. We get frustrated with the boss. Our kids do something that we're sure no one else's kids have ever done. And so we... Today, we lay aside a temporary and a yet necessary encumbrance. We're putting down the hammers so that we may take up with both hands the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and take our message of hope to a whole world, one person at a time. Today, as members of this church, our full attention, all of our resources, both materially and spiritually, are going to be directed toward the four primary objectives of this church. And we believe that the fulfillment of these objectives will help to bring uh, to realization that community of hope that I've been talking about this morning. The first objective that we have as a church is to elevate the name of God to a place of honor in this community where God has placed us. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. The Apostle Paul, in concluding his remarks to a church that was established in Rome, wrote these words as he was wrapping up his letter, and he encouraged the believers there to do this. Beginning in verse 5 and 6, he says this, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this business of elevating the name of God to a place of honor was important to the biblical authors, the men that God used to transmit His Word to the church today. And it should be important to those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ on this very special day, and certainly to those who are members of this church. It is our desire and our commitment to cause the name of God to be elevated, to be respected, to be honored, to be revered in this community. Not far from Lincoln, Kansas, there stands a strange group of gravestones. 
There was a guy named Davis. He was a farmer and a self-made man, and he had them erected. He began as a lowly hired hand, and by sheer determination and frugality, he managed to amass a considerable fortune in his lifetime. For in the process, however, the farmer did not make many friends, nor was he close to his wife's family, since they thought that she had married beneath her dignity. When his wife died, Davis erected an elaborate statue in her memory. He hired a sculptor to design a monument which showed both her and him at opposite ends of a love seat. He was so pleased with the result that he commissioned another statue, this time of himself, kneeling at her grave, placing a wreath on it. That impressed him so greatly that he planned a third monument. This time, his wife was kneeling at his future gravesite, placing a wreath on it. He had the sculptor add a pair of wings on his wife's back since she was no longer alive, giving her the appearance of an angel. One idea led to another until he had spent no less than a quarter of a million dollars on the monuments to himself and to his wife. After using up all his resources on stone statues and selfish pursuits, John Davis died at the age of 92, a grim-faced resident of the poorhouse. But the monuments, it's strange, each one is slowly sinking into the Kansas soil, quickly becoming victims of time. This story is a fascinating story because it reminds me that sometimes we are building monuments like these. Sometimes we spend the resources in our life, whether it's just sheer energy or financial resources, building monuments that are going to become victims of time. But as the days and the weeks and the years and the ages pass, they'll no longer exist. What folks think when they come to this church about this building is really not important to me. Now, honestly, what you think of the people here is not the most important thing either. Our hope as a church is that because of your time in this building and the time that you spend associating with these people, that you will develop a new perspective of God. That you will begin to see Him as He really is. As a loving Heavenly Father, perhaps a Father that you never had. Who in a time in history past gave the greatest demonstration that He could possibly think of to demonstrate that love to you. He became a man and gave His life willingly on what the Bible calls a tree. We understand it to be a cross, a place where He suffered and died, where His blood was shed, the Bible says, to cover the sin of mankind and forgive us from the things that we have done that are outside of His will. It's our hope that today, as you spend time here with us, that you might come to understand that God in a deeper, more meaningful way. And that that understanding might change your life forever, as it has for so many who are here today. The building is nice. We praise God for it. We waited a long time to be here. But friends, this is, is just a place from which we can see the, the love of God displayed in the community. That folks might come and see it and understand it and claim it for themselves. That is one of our highest purposes for being here. The Bible calls God the Lord of glory, the Almighty, the Prince of Peace, the Eternal Father, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. It's our desire that today you might claim Him to assume one of those roles in your life today, that He might be the Lord of your life. Our second purpose as a church is to educate the people in our community as to their spiritual need. Turn to Matthew chapter 28, please. Matthew chapter 28, a familiar passage of Scripture. We'll be looking at verses 19 and 20. These are the words of the Lord Jesus, some of the last words that He spoke before He ascended into heaven to be with the Father. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says this. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When the church began, it understood its objective. And that was to help people come to an understanding of their own spiritual need, and then to help those people respond to that spiritual need by becoming disciples or followers of Jesus Christ. What is a disciple? 
But verse 20 says that one of the goals of those original disciples, as they made more disciples, was to teach those people to obey all that Christ commanded them. By implication, then, a disciple is one who keeps the commandments of Christ, who endeavors to live according to those principles that Jesus demonstrated in his life. It's an issue of obedience. It's an issue of obedience. If I were to take a survey in this room today, including myself in that survey, I wonder how many of us could recite verbatim from memory all of the commands of Christ that are recorded in the New Testament. I would venture to say that I would fail that test myself quite miserably. And uh, I think that most of us would. Many of, the pe many, many of the people that are here today and many of the people in the world in general don't understand what God requires of them. They don't understand what God requires of them. One of our objectives as a church is to give the folks in this community enough information about God so that they might understand what His purpose for their life really is. In fact, just to give them enough information perhaps to encourage them to look more deeply into what God might have in mind for them. Perhaps you should ask yourself this question. If there is a God, what do I have to do with Him today? And what does He have to do with me? If there is a God, and if He is, as the Bible describes Him, all-powerful and all-knowing, and full of abundant love and grace, how does He relate to the events that I experience as I go through life? When I lose my job, when I get a new one, when a loved one dies or is, is injured beyond repair, how does my God relate to those issues in my life? And friends, if you begin to ask those questions, I would encourage you not to stop asking until you get satisfactory answers. And this much I can guarantee, if you search the Bible today for answers to those questions, you won't come away disappointed. You will find answers. And it's our hope as a church that we might provide enough information to perhaps uh, prick your interest, let's say or to cause you to become a little bit puzzled about the relationship that you may be missing with God today, so that you might ask these questions. There are people in this room today that are here because this church has a commitment to help people understand that God has a purpose for their life. As I was sitting here this morning and watching all of you come in, uh, it just made my heart happy because I know that many of you are here today because someone in this church took the time to talk to you about God. And to challenge you to take this book and destroy it. Take it apart if you can. And prove that it's a lie. I'm not afraid to give that challenge to anyone. Because I myself tried to do that to this book. Some 14 years ago. And I'm not the only one that's ever attempted it. There are two volumes of a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you like to read, if you have an analytical mind, I challenge you to read those books. They were written by a man who set out to discredit Christianity. And as he examined the Bible and the historicity of the story of Jesus, he came to the conclusion that he couldn't dismantle Christianity. So he wrote two books to help other people see that it is a reality. His name is Josh McDowell. Our commitment has always been and always will be to bring good news to this community. And that good news is the good news from God. That he loves you. And He has something in store for your life. And it's our desire that you might not miss that as you go through life on this journey. That you might take the time to stop and to see what God has for you. There's a third objective that we have as a church, and that is to encourage spiritual maturity in the lives of those who attend this church. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll be reading verses 11 to 16.
The Bible says here, and he gave some as apostles, that is, Jesus gave these men to the church. He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head in Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Those are a lot of words simply to say that God wants you not to be spiritual babies, not to be immature in your faith, but rather to grow beyond that point where you are introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior so that you might become a mature man, woman, or child in the faith. That you might assume a productive and responsible role in the congregation that you associate with and that you might be able to bring the good news that was at one time shared with you to other people and to help them become mature disciples of Christ who live a life of obedience. The following inscription is on the main wall near the old iron gate that leads to the campus of Harvard University. It says this, After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. Dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers lie in the dust. One of the oldest institutions of higher education in our nation that was founded just 16 years after the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock was established for the stated purpose of perpetuating an educated, well-trained body of godly men who would proclaim God's word with intelligence, conviction, and authority. But that great institution has fallen to the tide of liberalism and humanism. Now Mr. and Mrs. Christian USA are gasping for the fresh air of biblical teaching. Here at New Hope Community Church, when you go to the well of living water for a drink, I can promise you that you're not going to go away thirsty. If you decide to attend the services of this church on a regular basis, bring your Bible because we're going to open it every single Sunday. And if you were to come up here today and take this Bible away from me and tell me you would never return it again, then I would go home and I would sit down and my job would be finished because if I don't have the Bible to teach, there's no reason for this church to exist and there's no reason to be here. The one opinion that outweighs all other opinions in this church is God's. And when the leaders of this church have decisions to make, the place that they make those decisions is on their knees with an open Bible. Because what God thinks is the most important opinion that we need to listen to. If you're interested in what God has to say about life, or death, or marriage, or divorce, or finances, or love, or hate, or anger, raising your children, about sex, wisdom, or any other subject that you might think of, the place to go to find those answers is in the Bible. And if you attend this church, I promise you that we will give you an opportunity to search the scriptures for the answers to those questions about your life. We will challenge you to do that, and if you don't know how, we will find someone who can help you. Because our commitment is to the Word of God. And the Bible encourages all Christians to study and to grow in their understanding of who Jesus is and what He means to them on an individual basis through the course of their everyday life. In this church, church doesn't happen just on Sunday. It happens seven days a week. Because God doesn't live in this building. We call it a sanctuary because that's where Christians retreat to to be refreshed. It is not a sanctuary because God dwells here. The only time God is in this building is when it's filled with Christians because God lives here in the heart of human beings. 
Here at New Hope Community Church, we are committed to putting an end to biblical illiteracy. And we want you to understand the Bible and what God has in store for you. Finally, our last, but certainly not our least important objective as a church is to express our message of hope throughout the world. Turn to Acts chapter 1, please. Acts chapter 1. And we'll look at verses 7 and 8. Moments before Jesus ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father, He spoke these words to the disciples. They had asked about the end of the age. Jesus, when are you going to usher in your kingdom? When are you going to put an end to all the problems that we're facing? This Roman oppression that's going on right now. And Jesus says to them in verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by His own authority. But rather, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. The development of this worship center that you're enjoying this morning was no small accomplishment. But this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Our church is having an influence beyond the borders of this parcel of land, this city, and even this nation right now as we are gathered here in this room. We are doing that through people, through prayer, and through the material resources that we have offered to the Lord for use in His ministry. We are seeing the world change as a consequence of what occurs in this room and spreads out across the land. As we are meeting here today, there's a missionary couple. Some of you know them, Eric and Debbie Smith. They have two children, Derek and Ian. And they are sleeping right now on the island of Mindanao in Davao City in the Philippines. They're getting some rest because tomorrow is a busy day. And when the sun comes up, they're going to get up and they're going to go out across that island and they're going to begin helping churches in the Philippines raise up their own missionaries and start their own churches and villages all over that island and all over all of the islands in the Philippines because they have a goal. Their goal is, is called Dawn 2000. And that goal is to see 2,000 village churches planted by the year 2000 and to see 2,000 missionaries raised up in Filipino churches to be sent to the Asian continent by the year 2000. Eric and Debbie Smith are an extension of the ministry of this church. We support them uh, through prayer. Whenever they come back to the States, uh, man, we treat them like their family. I mean, this whole church treats them just like they're a member of their family. We send them stuff at Christmas time and all the things that are important to people. And they send us news every month of how the work continues in those places. We also support through prayer missionaries in Saipan with the Far Eastern Broadcasting Company who are sending radio messages into the Soviet Union in places that have been closed to the gospel for years and years and years. We support missionaries in France through prayer. Beth and Stuart Webster were just here telling us about their church planting work in a little town just outside Lyon, France. What an exciting work is going on here. We support uh, missionaries through prayer in Japan. We're praying for Cecil and Debbie O'Dell and uh, uh, the Kernbauers who are doing church planting in Tokyo, trying to bring the message of the cross to the Japanese people. All of these people are extensions of this church as we are taking the message of hope across the land. We're doing some things on a more local level here too, in the community as well. Uh, we support the ministry of the Evangel Home, which cares for women and children who are displaced or abused. Uh, we also support the ministry of the Crisis Pregnancy Center uh, and the work that they do with unborn children and their mothers. And we can go on and on with the various ministries that we support uh, here in the community. Why are we doing all of this? There's a story in a book by Shel Silverstein. It's entitled The Giving Tree, and I believe that it explains what this church is all about. And I'd like to share it with you in closing this morning. The story is about a tree that loved a boy. When the boy was young, he and the tree used to get together and they would play for long hours. When the boy got older, he spent less and less time with the tree. And one day, Take my stump and 
and sit down and rest yourself. And the boy did, and Tree was glad that he'd been able to be of service to the boy through all the different parts of his life. He was a giving tree, and he gave all that it had to meet the needs of that boy on his journey through life. I like to think that New Hope Community Church is a giving tree. That wherever you are in life today, wherever you will be in 10 or 20 or 30 years, that we might be able to enjoy a relationship with you. And to see God provide to the membership of this church what you need at that moment in life. We'd like to share the good times, and we'd like to share the crisis as well. Those of us who've had some experience in life with God, some here in this room, who I love and admire, have spent years walking with the Lord. And they know how Jesus is near, both during the good times and the bad. And it's our prayer, it's our hope, that we might be of service to you in whatever way you might find a need present in your life. At whatever stage of life you might find yourself, that you might remember that this church is dedicated towards that purpose of being an instrument in God's hand to bring into your life whatever it is that you might need. This is our mission. And it is towards these goals that we will dedicate ourselves today. In the bulletin, there's a responsive reading. I'd like the folks who attend this church regularly to take out that responsive reading. Those of you who are guests today, we're so pleased to have you here. You are more than guests in reality. You bear witness to the commitment that this church makes today. This is a sacred ceremony, something that we take quite seriously. We hope that you'll follow along as we read together this commitment that's being made this morning. We'll begin reading in unison at the top of the page, and then as you can see, New Hope members and, and regular attenders, the congregational responses are listed there. And I will read the part for the pastor, and then you can respond by reading those sections this morning. Let's begin together. On this 28th day of October, in the year of our Lord, 1990, we, the family of New Hope Community Church, do dedicate ourselves, our personal resources, and this building to the purposes of the church, the body of Christ, as they are declared in God's word and demonstrated in our individual lives. Those purposes, as they are set forth in the infallible word of God, have been and shall always be, to bring glory to the Lord our God through the Son in all that we endeavor to do. faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. to other believers in the body of Christ.
expand our ministry of evangelism and edification through home and foreign missions. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we have spoken these words this morning not by rote, but rather out of a committed heart that we might express publicly in this room today that our commitment is to the four biblical principles that we've spoken about this morning. We pray, Father, that as we submit ourselves to you and the work of your Spirit in our lives, that we might be able to fulfill these objectives to your praise and to your glory. Lord, we know that the work of the church is not a job for one man or woman, but rather it is a job for the hands of many people, people whose hearts are committed completely to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and whose minds are stayed on the principles of God's Word, and whose commitment is to share that message of hope with those in this community. Father, we thank you for the many hours of labor that have gone into the building of this building and the one next door and the development of this site. We thank you that you've provided us a place from which we can reach out into the neighborhood and the world. We thank you today that you will be our guide. At times in the future we might sense some lostness or misdirection that we can turn to you and your word and you will provide for us an insight into the future. You will decide for us what course we should take. Lord, we know that the spiritual life of the believer is not static. It events occur that seem to change those things for people. I know that today in this room, Lord, there are those who at some time in the past have been discouraged or who have perhaps lost confidence in you as their God. And it's my prayer today, Lord, that you might, by the power of your Spirit, convince them to renew again that relationship that they once had with you that they might open the door that's been closed in their heart and they might let you come in and reside once again. We pray, Father, that that might be expressed by a decision to be obedient rather than indifferent. And we pray that there might be practical ways that you will remind them of to express that commitment today. We pray you will bring them back into the fellowship of this church. We thank you, Lord, for those today who are not in this room because they serve faithfully in the classrooms for our children. We love them, Lord, and we thank you for giving such wonderful servants to us. And we pray today that you would be an encouragement to them, that you would help them to pursue excellence. We pray, Father, that you might be their encouragement, and that you might help us as we leave this room this morning to express a word of gratitude and thanks to their faithfulness. Father, we thank you most of all today for the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, who in time, in history past, visited this planet. And he came to provide salvation, salvation which is so desperately needed by a lost world. We thank you for the example of his life. We thank you for the benefits of his death. We pray that we might be reminded this day, the first day of the week, that we celebrate his resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this church. He is here today. We celebrate with joy his life and the everlasting life that he has given to each one who has believed in him. We pray now, Lord, that you would be the pilot of this ship and that you would guide us steadily into our future as a church. And we thank you for the leadership that you've provided in the lives of people here today, for the hard work, and for those who's Life has been exemplary in terms of their commitment to you. Thank you, Lord, for this exciting and wonderful time. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Right now, I want to invite Lee Copeland, a special friend of mine, the chairman of our board of elders, to the pulpit. I just want to say a word about this man. He had no idea I was going to do this, but before I turn the microphone over to him, you know, the one who has the microphone has the most power. <laughs> before I give it to him, I just want to say a word about this man. He's the kind of guy who very quietly with his wife has been working in the background 
these many years that we've been endeavoring to build a church, much of what you see in this room today uh, was provided by his steady hand and the commitment of he and his wife and family to uh, build a place where God could be honored. You notice the stained glass windows, for example. Lee and his wife spearheaded that project and in fact put some of these windows together. And uh, we thank God for that. This pulpit that I'm standing behind, he built in his garage and brought here today. He crossed the hangs on the wall above the bath baptistry was crafted by a carpenter named Lee Copeland and one who has the, the chief carpenter residing in this army. And I just want to say a word of thanks and express my gratitude to Lee for being my friend, for being a co-worker and for all that God has enabled him to do for this project in this church. Let's give him a big hand this morning. Uh, a little less than 12 years, and uh, Carol and I have been with the church for most of that time. And we started off in a middle school over on Thorn Avenue someplace, I don't know the name of the school, but then we went to the Old People's Church facility in Dakota. Still didn't have a place we could call home. We knew we needed one, but uh, the Lord just didn't provide at that time. Then we started meeting out here in North Clovis in a, in a church that was not occupying their own building on Sunday mornings. And during that time, about uh, five years ago, the board spotted a piece of property over here that seemed possible. With the Lord's guidance, we might be able to procure a piece of it. And uh, as that came to uh, fruition, we did get a four-acre piece of par uh, four acre parcel of land here that was free and clear, which uh, then inspired us to go ahead and begin a building program. And uh, I'm an incurable optimist. I just knew that we could pull this thing off for uh, $150,000 in two years. And you know how things typically go. It takes twice that long. And uh, there has been some frustrations along the way. We've seen people come and go. And there's probably only 20 or 25 families that are still here from the initial um, body of believers. But. Uh, it's been a, an extreme blessing for me to, to watch this happen because it was not a project that we could just go out and contract somebody to do it and step back and watch it be built and then six months or a year move in. Uh, we decided to do it ourselves. And um, it's caused a lot of us to work together Saturday after Saturday. And um, there's a lot of important fellowship and, and spiritual growth that takes place in that situation not to mention the uh, financial contributions that everybody is making all along and, and trying to make this thing go. Uh, everybody in the, in the church has contributed from driving nails to preparing the lunches that we enjoyed after a morning's work over here. And uh, there is uh, no way really to express to each, each person. I wish there was a way to recognize each and every one. Uh, but we're not going to try to do that. I'm sure that the Lord will bless them in His own time. There is one couple, though, that I think stands head and shoulders above all the rest in this endeavor, and uh, the the timeless uh, hours and dedication that this couple has has brought to our church. Not to mention the modeling of, of a, a Christian spirit that has guided us through this. Uh, I think definitely deserves recognition. So, uh, without further ado, I would like Ed and Clara Murbach to come up here, please. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have her on it, of course. There's 
sent it to Ed and Claire Marpa, from one farmer to, to another, well done, my good and faithful servant, with love and appreciation from the family at New Hope Community Church, October 28th, 1990. important and the encouragement that we see. I can remember when we first started out over here on a big pile of two or horse there and I had the overhead saw set up. Who came over to help at Carol Cooper? So I said here we're going to cut cripples and we're going to cut blocking and we're going to cut headers and so she rolled up her sleeves and she had the children with her and the children stacked as she cut and I was able to do other things and it encouraged me somehow no matter what happened we're going to finish this project with this kind of people and this kind of encouragement and likewise the people have given have given them the same dedication and, and you know it's usually women that are responsible for these things. <laughs> so I thank my wife and I thank her too. Thank you so much for the opportunity.
the system and not change in your relationship with God. Perhaps you're a Christian and you'd like to renew that relationship with one standard. Perhaps you're here today and you don't really know what it means to know Jesus as your Savior. I'd like to invite you after the service to go to one of our two council meetings, either on my right or my left. There'll be someone there who'll be glad to talk with you and show you from God's Word how you can know Jesus in a personal way. So after the prayer, there'll be some music. And those of you who want to go ahead and lunch and can do so. But if you'd like to talk with someone this morning, we invite you to stay and to see one of the counselors afterwards. Let's pray together. Grace